I like to think that we do a lot of projects around here. Good projects, fun projects even, projects that don't go much further than the boundary of a circuit board. I joke because there are a lot of electrical systems that don't look like that. Many systems will span the size of a factory, warehouse, or city. Projects like these push the limits of what is possible for electrical systems. 10, 100, or even 1,000 foot cable length maximums are all fine and good until you find a building that's 3,000 feet long. It's obvious that massive structures like that really do exist, so therefore we must have a way to deal with long cable runs that experience interference from motors, radio frequency energy, and other nearby electrical systems. We're breaking down some ways that systems are commonly interfered with while discussing a few common mitigations or fixes for those interferences. In short, we're preparing our printed circuit board assembly to enter the real world. Now, I know this video will likely be a little dry for some, but if you're thinking about designing a real product and you care about whether it works or not, please continue watching. Not for me, but for you. We're going to touch on some pretty critical parts of electronic circuit design that leads to building more robust and more compliant products. Believe it or not, dealing with interference in real electrical systems has more to do with EMC and EMI than it might seem on the surface. What is EMI or EMC? These are tiny acronyms that can bring entire companies to their knees. Electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility. These are general terms used to refer to a suite of electrical tests that ensure that systems are resistant to interference from outside influences and don't interfere with other nearby systems. For almost every product containing electronics sold in the United States, FCC compliance is mandatory. In most other countries, very similar standards and restrictions exist, usually with the exact same limits, but sometimes there are minor differences. This basic level of compliance helps to ensure that the electrical products in our world, like a computer, won't interfere with critical operations like police radio, aircraft radio, and traffic lights. It does this by setting limits for the amount of RF energy devices can radiate or emit at a particular frequency. This is sometimes called a radiated emissions limit. Some people like to toe the line here with their behavior by building illegal devices like jammers or other radios that mess with critical systems, but I think that's a really quick way to have a bad time. Believe it or not, it's become trivially easy to triangulate the source of a radio signal, so if you want to know what a bad time looks like, start transmitting on critical radio frequencies and count how long it takes for someone to show up at your door. My guess? Faster than you might expect. Seriously? Don't. Just don't. It's irresponsible at best, dangerous at worst, and definitely illegal. So thankfully for you, me, and every company in the world, there are some very helpful exceptions to that mandatory EMC testing, the, the minimum amount of testing required for every electronic product. Or at least there used to be. And by the way, this is not legal or professional advice, so consult a legal expert in your region before you start doing anything, or you might find yourself in some trouble. At least the last time I read the FCC regulations over my morning coffee, it appeared like if you're building less than five devices, you never sell them, and you aren't intentionally interfering with other systems, you're in the clear. Of course, this exception exists for research and development purposes. We need to allow some amount of untested or uncertified devices to exist in the world because every device isn't certified before it gets certified. It's the nature of building something new. We need to build it before it can be tested. And that's great and all, but I thought we were talking about building systems that can resist interference, so why am I prattling on about EMC, transmitting radio waves, and interference with other systems? As it turns out, RF energy is awesome. And in the same way that antennas can both transmit and receive energy, translating between radio waves and electrical signals, the same structures built out of traces on a circuit board, or cables, can both radiate energy into the world and provide an opportunity for outside energy to enter a system. This is why emissions and susceptibility are both critical parts of EMC or EMI testing. Emissions and susceptibility are reflections of one another, distinctly different, but deeply related. We may be thinking about susceptibility or how our systems affected by others today, but it's always best to consider both sides of that coin. Let's apply this to our problem today. What will it take for our system to be interfered with by something else? Simple. We need a device to exist in the world that is operating at a frequency. These 
generally can't be avoided because we all want systems to do something. Switch mode power supplies, microcontrollers, digital interfaces, amplifiers, these all require voltages to change at frequencies when functioning correctly. Well, then we'll need a coupling mode. That is, we need a mechanism for that frequency to get out of this system and into what's called a far field radiation pattern. One might call this an antenna, though that word is generally reserved for intentional radiators. We then need a coupling mode to translate some energy from that system into ours. And then we need a sensitivity in our system to energy at that frequency. Electrical systems are complex by nature and almost never contain only one frequency. For example, in a square wave, the fundamental frequency in every odd harmonic. For this example, that's every odd multiple of 10 kilohertz. So 10, 30, 50, 70 kilohertz, and so on, with decreasing magnitude as frequency increases. We might only think about the fundamental frequency, but there is always harmonic content, unless we're dealing with pure sine waves. I think it's pretty easy to imagine the devices and systems that I'm talking about, so let's really focus on defining what a coupling mode can be. There are four primary coupling modes that easily come to mind, probably because these are the ones that have bit me more in the products that I've developed. Those are RF coupling, capacitive coupling, inductive coupling, and common mode impedance coupling. As I'm hearing that list, I really want to throw magnetic in there too, but it's basically the same thing as inductive coupling. So what I mean is magnetic fields are inducing currents in a board. Whether those fields are coming from a current carrying conductor, a coil of wire, a moving magnet is irrelevant. It's still like that magnetic field interaction. In every system, well, at least everyone that I've seen, there will be coupling modes. There will be noise in the environment and there will be sensitive frequencies. I can't tell you exactly what those might be without taking it to a test house, but trust me, they exist. Thankfully, there are a couple general strategies that we can employ to help avoid problems here for reasonable power levels. I think there's a power level that every device will start to break down and not function correctly or be permanently damaged, but you know, reasonable power levels as defined in the standards. Eliminating obvious or unnecessary coupling modes or sensitivities is a great start. If it doesn't need to be there, get it out of there. Beyond that, adding as much series impedance and parallel load for high frequency energy that's not necessary is a great step. Providing a safe and controlled path to ground for high frequency energy with something like a TVS capacitor and or MOV or MOV can help a lot, depending on the frequency. Adding a series impedance like an inductor, common mode choke, or ferret bead can help too. Assuming that high frequency energy doesn't need to pass through a given cable, getting rid of it's probably the easiest way to deal with it. Of course, if the system that we're talking about today is moving USB data or DisplayPort data from one place to another, we might need to use a different strategy because there's high frequency content in the communication protocol that we can't destroy. So sometimes adding a shield wire or a full shield around a cable can help a lot. Implementing a twisted pair instead of a ribbon cable can help too. These are some common methods of transient suppression and shielding that I've seen used many, many times. These will all help a system to be more resistant to interference and help to prevent interfering with other nearby equipment at the same time. The unfortunate truth is that everything we just mentioned really falls apart for a couple particularly nasty types of interference. Common mode impedance coupling, especially when on a ground conductor, can cause a lot of problems. This type of interference actually has the audacity to turn that shield that we just implemented to fix most DMC issues into a giant coupling mode. Common mode impedance coupling can affect an electrical system in a few different ways. Um, one of those would be a ground shift on a PCBA level where there's currents flowing through a circuit board that change the ground reference local to a design, but also on a, a broader scale when the ground potential, especially earth ground potential, is different when measured at two different geographical locations. Almost every system is referenced back to earth ground local to that piece of equipment. Whether it be a direct galvanic chassis connection, a resistive connection through leakage currents or capacitive coupling through a transformer, almost everything is referenced back to earth's electrical potential energy somehow because mains, the grid, is referenced back to earth ground. 
Ideally, ground, especially earth ground, would be the same voltage everywhere. But that's quite simply not the case. On a micro scale, like a power strip, sure, maybe your ground potential is constant. But on the scale of a factory, stadium, or city, absolutely not. Of course, I'm not talking about hundreds of volts here, but the magnitude is kind of irrelevant. It doesn't really matter. Uh, for a 5 volt signal, maybe you need a few tens of millivolts to interfere. But if we start talking about 1.8 or 3.3 volt signaling, a few millivolts might start to matter. Some electrical interfaces are more sensitive to common mode impedance coupling on ground than others, but we'll start to experience some problems if we don't consider this effect. Even without steady state DC offsets, large loads like motors and HVAC systems cycling on and off can cause intermittent voltage transients or leakage currents through ground conductors. This is where a combination of isolation and differential signaling really comes into play. Isolation prevents a DC offset on signal conductors from passing through our circuitry, and differential signaling effectively negates the most common types of interference, because most interference will manifest as common mode, or a DC offset, on both conductors. That's true for common impedance coupling and for almost every other coupling mode in the world when two conductors are very near one another and especially when they're twisted together or in a coaxial kind of configuration. This is true because a very similar amount of energy will generally be injected into both conductors, so the positive and negative conductor of a differential pair will move together. Therefore, the voltage measured from one conductor to the other won't change very much, even if the voltage of either conductor measured to ground changes a lot. A great side effect of this isolation is a bit of fault tolerance. It's easy to imagine that an electrical system could become unintentionally connected to mains somewhere, especially for big systems, and not destroying every piece of electronics connected to that same interface sounds pretty great. I feel like I might be starting to spin in circles here, but if nothing else, I've given us all a whole lot to think about. At least for my university, the content of this entire video was never discussed. This is a crash course in a few fields of study that made me pull my hair out at EMC test houses for a few collective months of my life. Sometimes you're testing your own baby, sometimes it's someone else's baby. Am I the only one that talks to electronics they've designed like it's their child? Uh, hopefully that's not too weird. Coming up next, we'll be selecting an LED driver technology for the DMX light project, and I'm really excited for the next step. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm about to make a big mistake, so it should be a lot of fun. As always, I'd like to give a special thank you to our channel members on Patreon and YouTube. I really appreciate the extra step you've taken to support us directly. I'd also like to thank you all for your support through viewership, comments, sharing what we do with others, those who choose to watch ads, and those who are subscribed. It has been awesome and humbling to watch this E for Everyone community grow, and that can't happen without you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for watching E for Everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!